and welcome to episode three of the Taskmaster podcast. My name's Ed Gamble. I am the current champion of Taskmaster. Don't go calling me the former champion of Taskmaster. I am the current champion of Taskmaster until one of these five wins the series. And until then, I will cling on to that crown with bloody, bloody fingers. But anyway, it was a good episode. I cannot wait to chat through it, uh, dissect, discuss with my special guest how it went, what we thought the highlights and lowlights were, who we thought the stars were, who had a bad episode, who had a good episode, all of that lovely stuff as well as reminiscing about our time on Taskmaster together. Yes, that's right. Today's Taskmaster podcast guest is Series 9 alum, Joe Brand. Very excited that Joe said yes to this. Uh, I like Joe a lot. We got on very well during the series, and it was just lovely to catch up. Uh, Remember, if you haven't seen Episode 3, Series 10 of Taskmaster, do not listen to this episode of the podcast. That's what we're going to be chatting about. Major spoiler warnings. Go away, watch the episode, then come back, listen to this, and you can experience it in its full glory. Uh, Taskmaster is obviously on Channel 4, at 9pm every Thursday. That's when it goes out. Don't miss an episode, then don't miss an episode of this, which comes out straight after that. But if you've got kids and you're worried that there might be some rude bits, worried if the task is going to be like, who has the most naked bum, then watch the E4 broadcast, 6pm Sundays. That's when that goes out. They'll cover up the bums. I mean, the task of a most naked bum won't be won't be as good because you won't see any naked bums. So no one should really get five points. Uh, I don't think that's a task, by the way. Uh, I've not seen episodes four to ten, but I'm fairly sure most naked bum doesn't come up. Alex has got some brilliant ideas, but he's not had that one yet. But Alex, if you're listening to this, how about most naked bum? So let's crack on and chat to the wonderful Joe Brand about episode three, series ten of Taskmaster. Here we go. Welcome, Joe Brand, to the Taskmaster podcast. Thank you very much, Ed Gamble. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, You are our first uh, season nine alumni on the Taskmaster podcast. Oh, good. (laughs) (laughs) You were the only person we wanted when we thought, who are we getting from season nine? It's got to be Joe Brand. The Um, lazy one with no (laughs) creativity in her bones at all. Well, you say the lazy one, but you lent into the lazy thing so perfectly that it was, you know, it, it didn't feel lazy. You actually put a lot into the effort of being lazy, which renders it not lazy, I think. Well, yeah, I hope not. I mean, I, I kind of weighed things up and I thought there's no way that I'm going to win this because <laughs> I'm, cause I have like such a weird life. Sometimes I have like really brilliant days, but I'm very inconsistent. So I knew I was going to have one day where I just went totally all wrong and probably started crying. And I think it was that one where there's a load of stuff hanging on the ceiling and I didn't even notice it. And then Alex went, can you name as many things that were hanging from the ceiling as possible? And I went, was there stuff hanging from the ceiling? That sort of thing. A bit like when Catherine did her um, where's the frying pan panic. Yeah. I've not seen the frying pan. Where is it? I really, I really <laughs> empathise with that. But you you didn't really panic in any of those situations. You were just like, oh, well, move on, next one. Well, that's true, but that's because it, it, it didn't really warrant it. When I was at a psychiatric nurse working in a 24-hour walk-in emergency clinic, the sort of emergencies there did warrant it, and there was nothing in Taskmaster that was anywhere <laughs> near as scary, to be honest. Yeah, see, I don't have that level of life experience or perspective where I could sort of draw on my experience as a psychiatric nurse and go, well, this doesn't <laughs> really matter, does it? For me, <laughs> things hanging from the ceiling, that is the biggest panic I've ever had in my life. So, <laughs> Well, you see, the thing was actually, in, in some ways, to be a winner, which of course you were, you did exactly the right thing. You were very competitive. You reminded me of my little brother when he's about 11, uh, who he would he would kind of do anything to stop me winning, um, including sort of breaking like, you know, I used to play tennis a little bit where, and, and play in tournaments and that he actually broke my tennis racket once so that he could win the game. I'm not implying that you're like that, that you're violent, but you are a good competitor and you do I think brilliantly. I- I'm not sure I would break your tennis racket. I'd maybe hide your tennis racket. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's I think that's the level. <laughs> 
Do you have any do you have any favorite task memories from our season? Now obviously not noticing the things hanging from the ceiling is a painful task memory, but do you have any highlights? Well, I quite enjoyed singing Jerusalem in the back of a car to uh, Alex, which was a way of uh, waiting for an egg to boil perfectly. And what was so satisfying about it was it actually worked as well. And I think it was the perfect consistency. I think you, uh, yeah, I think you won that task, didn't you? It was the perfect jammy consistency. And I have since tried that. I do sing Jerusalem when I'm boiling an egg now. So that's had a long lasting effect on my life. Uh, let's hope that's being repeated all over the country. <laughs> I loved, I loved that task and your your taking of it in particular because. Um, when you first sit down for that first episode and they play you the theme tune and the title sequence, there's little clips of everything people have done across the series. And that is the first time you get a clue as to what the other people are like. Uh, and there was just a tiny little clip of you screaming Jerusalem yeah. in the back of in the back of a car. And I could not for the life of me work out what task that would have been that from. Was. <laughs> So it yeah. took a few episodes. I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense now. But no one else would have thought to have get got in their car home to finish the task. Well, and I'm sure that like everybody says, don't they, about Taskmaster, that um, it's such a shock getting to see what the other people have done. Because it's very easy to be in your own little bubble and think, yeah, I definitely won this one. Yeah. you know, And you see that quite a lot with every Taskmaster. People think, I'm all right here, you know. At maximum points, and then it suddenly starts to show on their face yeah. that they've been a complete idiot. <laughs> so you say g- going into our series, you you assumed you were going to do badly. You knew you weren't going to win, um, but had you yeah. sized had you sized up the other contestants? Obviously, you kn- you knew David for a long time before. Did you have an inkling that he might be uh, considerably worse than you? Um, I didn't really, because I think we all assume that if someone's extremely intelligent, which he is, that they will be very creative and they will be practical, which, of course, is a ridiculous thing to think, because you should really think the opposite of that, shouldn't you? There's some old professor type shuffling around in their office, never lifted a hand domestically in their lives, and they've got no idea how to do practical things that I should have known, really. Yeah, that's when you meet really, truly intelligent people like sort of Oxford Dons or people who've, you know, been in academia their whole lives, they're often quite odd because they've just been buried in a book. And yeah, I'm calling David Baddiel a lot. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm calling him out publicly. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I, we'd not worked together properly before. Uh, were the others new to you as well? Were Katie and Rose new uh, new faces to you? Uh, yeah, they were, actually. Um, that was nice, you know, because us elderly members of the comedy community, we're aware that people are running after us, trying to section us and get us into old people's homes. And we're still <laughs> shouting out swear ones and going, I will not be silenced. But, you know, it's nice to kind of get <laughs> asked to do something with people in it that are younger than you. And don't, when you ask, how are you, don't say the word arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think, yeah, d- despite you and uh, David being the elder statesman of the records, quite often, especially you, were the worst behaved during the records. You started a thing where you did a different style of clapping every time we came back from a break. Ah, oh, yeah. Just well, to, And if you look carefully at the edit, you can see, and I joined in because I'm very easily led astray <laughs> by the naughty one in the class. Um, you can see me and Joe trying out different clapping. And at one point, you would just had your hands like a little bird <laughs> instead of yes. clapping. I think that arose from the Nicole Kidman clap at the Oscars, where she, you know, where she did that weird thing where she kind of pinged her fingers together and they pinged right out. Yeah. And then after that, I thought I'm going to try and invent something better than that. I don't think I did, but you know, it was more fun than just doing proper grown-up It was. Clapping. It was. <laughs> So I, we'll talk more about our memories from Series 9 uh, later on in the podcast, Joe. But I think for now we should crack on to Episode 3, 
of Series 10. Now, obviously, this is the lineup following us. There's a lot of pressure on them. Uh, how, what do you think of them as a lineup in general so far? Well, I was trying to think, are they sort of a kind of reflection of the the lineup we were? You know, are there are there sort of um, sort of elder statesmen? And I suppose in in a way that you or women, you've got uh, Johnny uh, Vegas, uh, and you've also got Richard Herring, two very different characters. Um, I think Johnny's great because you never quite know what he's going to do. Um, but I think he's got a brilliant kind of creativity and unpredictability about him. Uh, whereas Richard is, Richard, I think, is extremely bright and he's very kind of benign compared to Johnny. So they're sort of a good balance for each yeah. other. So I don't know if they sort of reflected me and Dave in a way. Um Catherine Parkinson, I think, also reflected me a bit because I was so hopeless at things. And she occasionally is, is she's so charming in the way she fails to notice something, you know, yeah. or, or she doesn't quite really understand what, well, like, like catapult, for example, you know, <laughs> her, her catapult knowledge was obviously from sort of just William, where yeah. someone actually held a catapult <laughs> with a bit of knicker elastic and pinged a conquer at her or something. Yeah, because her, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely come to that later, but uh, her immediate thought was uh, a, a twig with two other twigs coming off it, which is basically a Dennis the Menace Beano catapult, right? That's... Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Bless her. But first there was the prize task, uh, which was best thing with a spring in it. Now, uh, how did you enjoy the prize task, Joe, when, when we did it? Um, well, I, I actually got it sort of wrong. So I thought all the prizes had to be from your own house. <laughs> so it's, it kind of limited me a bit. But also, in a way, it was liberating too, because it just meant I had to think a bit harder. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot, actually. And um, I must say, I was I was certainly impressed by some of yours. I remember that one being um, a certain um, tube that dispensed glitter, or uh, at a given moment, which the I confetti, really like. Confetti cannon party pants. Yeah, that's the one. Indeed, <laughs> that was my favourite. I think. So well, yours uh, yours were very inventive as well. I, I I seem to remember smoothest thing being a highlight, which was uh, you had an action man in a uh, bowl of blancmange. Uh, yeah, no, no, in a bowl of um, uh, butterscotch angel delight. Butterscotch angel delight, <laughs> the smoothest thing. I think that that was my favourite. What would you have? Uh, what would you have done for best thing with a with a spring in it? Best thing that probably that has a spring probably in it. And that's a very a key, very key bit of language. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I would have tried to get something. Uh, I I might have tried to pretend I'd shoplifted from an antique shop or something. <laughs> You know, so got something like very old and interesting. Well, I thought Johnny's one arm bandit was great, for example. Yeah, yeah I think that that won, didn't it? And I think that was uh, I think that was a deserved winner. I would have because Richard again, Richard showing that he's probably the most competitive and pernickety of the whole bunch. Uh, immediately going in with picking up on the language and saying it's it doesn't count if it definitely has a spring in it. It only has to probably have a spring in it, which yeah. is. I mean, it would have he would have got on my nerves if we'd been in the same series, I think, because I'm competitive, but he he is really competitive. Yes, but he's also pedantic as well. Pedantic, well, that's exactly what you he would, is. You would just kind of challenge a decision against you with, like, pure anger. Pure 11-year-old <laughs> tennis anger, yeah. <laughs> Whereas Richard is a bit more measured in his he objection is. to his being given one point. Or whatever. Yeah, it, yeah. Exactly. I liked his penguin thing, though. I think that I think that was good. And obviously, I think he appealed to Greg's sensibilities because it came with a stupid noise and a song. Yes. Uh, and doing that made Greg laugh. And I think that's that's very much the key in in some of these. Yes. It's. I think it's quite hard to predict. Um, you know what Greg's going to like sometimes. Because I think, like Daisy, for example, she she kind of goes for like stupid things that are very simple. Yeah, very and simple. Po possibly she thinks Greg is very stupid and very simple <laughs> because she's always a bit shocked when he doesn't like its yeah. kind of clever simplicity. 
And she always has that face on her, like, oh, you know, did you not realize that was genius? And I yeah. like that about her. She's she's kind of got such a huge amount of self confidence that everything she does is brilliant. It's, it's great. like a great point to start from. And I really love that. Yeah. And especially in the prize task, you're right, because she's, I think, like my like my favorite of your prize task was the action man in the Angel Delight. And that takes a little bit of explaining. None of hers have taken any explaining whatsoever. It's just one word and you immediately know why she's done it. It's, it is just stuff she's grabbed on the way out of the house. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Here come the big guns. She's previously bought in a crumpet. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Umbrella. She's brought an umbrella. I tell you why. If this oh. was a question on family fortunes, I would win with that, and I would w have won with my crumpets. I don't think you should come on here and apply the rules of different <laughs> <shows>. <laughs> I think uh, Mawan, for me, in this round, summed up the entire Taskmaster experience when he showed his mattress, and then everyone started asking about, does it probably have a spring in it? Does it definitely have a spring in it? Is it a memory foam mattress? And he just looked really confused and then said, what do you want to hear? Yes, absolutely. He just wanted them to move on. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I thought it was a bit of a kind of bonus this, that his mattress wasn't, because most people's are, uh, you know, it wasn't covered in sort of rather unpleasant <laughs> or, or unexplainable stains. Yeah. Well, had he put a cover over it, I think he probably had. I would never bring my mattress in. <laughs> Um, I think Daisy was unlucky to come bottom there. I think Greg's getting fed up with the simplicity of the uh, yeah. uh, of the the prize tasks from her. Um, Catherine's water pistol again, two points. That felt okay. I think Johnny deserved to win, but I felt like the rest of them did pretty well and probably deserved a few more points. Apart from Moan, if it is a memory foam, it probably doesn't have a spring in it, so I'm not sure he should have got any points. No, because it, he should have he should have known that there was a negative there rather than a possible positive. Exactly. And what we're finding out about Moan over the last couple of episodes is that he does sometimes doesn't read the task properly, but it is very funny. Um, oh, I can empathise with that because yeah. <laughs> I did that as well. Totally didn't read it properly a lot of the time. Yeah, that's because you couldn't be bothered, though, Joe. You yeah, know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> So we move on to the first task of the episode, best upside down film, which personally would have panicked me a lot. Any of those creative ones normally threw me into a, threw me into a bit of a panic. They all actually seem to be pretty much on, on it straight away. I mean, I wouldn't have had a clue what to do, really. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, uh, because I, I'm kind of a bit weird with my left and right and my up and down, and I reckon I would have done something that I thought was upside down, and then when it was finished, it would actually be the right way up, and so I would have been disqualified. Well, let's talk about Daisy straight away then, because that's pretty much exactly what happened to her. She decided to shoot a film where everything was upside down, but then she also put the camera upside down, so when they showed the film back, it everything was the right way up. Cancels it out. Yeah, it just completely cancels it out. <laughs> Technically, I suppose it is an upside down film. It was shot upside down, but the, it doesn't lend anything to the film at the end of it. It's just a normal film. You'd have to tell someone that it was filmed upside down. But I think she's clearly on the same page as Johnny, because in the first episode... Johnny did a chicken film, didn't he? When he had to make something disappear, he he did a he did an angry chicken. Oh, that's uh, right, destroying yes, yeah. London. And those two seem to have got, they've got they've got a sort of psychic link. I don't, they're sat next to each other, but they seem to be getting on really well. I think they've uh, I think they're on the same page. No, I totally agree with you, and I think um, you know it, it. It actually, to some extent, Catherine reminds me a bit of Katie Wicks in ours, which is that. I don't know what it is about having to learn lots of words if you're an actor. It just yeah. kind of makes you a, a very different kind of prospect from a comedian, really. This task in particular, Catherine's acting really stood out, didn't it? Like the her well, upside down ups face. Her with the... upside. I really loved her upside down yeah. um, face. And I thought it looked really good, whereas... Um, the others kind of looked slightly thrown together, which is understandable. Mine would yeah. have done as well. Hers looked sort of attractive and professional, like yes. her, really. You know. Yeah, 
Well, uh, but yet again, she it, it cut back to her and she was crying tears of laughter. I think after every task, she seems to have a, a sort of mini breakdown, which is great. I love, I love that that's her angle on Taskmaster is to have a meltdown after every task. Well, I think so, because I think on Taskmaster, I would have found it really easy to just either start crying or to kind of throw my belongings on the floor and stomp out and refuse to come back. Because you have absolutely no idea what level of humiliation yeah. is awaiting you, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I think um, if you're, I mean, I wouldn't say I was a particularly fragile person, but sometimes I would think, oh, no, you know, I, I know what's coming now and I'm going to look like such an ass. But you really cannot let that kind of affect you because you have to remember that when you look like that, people like that, especially people that can't yeah. stand you. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, and so in, in a way, you're a winner to some extent in the end. Yeah, exactly. I think there's, you know, you don't have to win the task if you come out of it with a memorable moment. I think that's that's just as important as winning. Yeah, um, absolutely. I totally agree. But I love that you say you, when things when things started playing that you panicked and remembered what you did because I'd say eighty percent of the time I was sat in between you and David Baddiel and then the task would start on the screen and you'd lean across me to each other and say, "Do you remember this? I don't remember this. I've got no idea. I've got no idea what's going to happen. No memory of it whatsoever." I know, and weirdly, I remembered quite a few that um, hadn't actually got in, and I was waiting for them to come up, and they never did. So <laughs> there were a couple that I thought I'd done quite well in, so I was. I was a bit kind of, oh. Do you, you remember know. what those were now? They absolutely well, love it on the podcast when we have little behind the scenes things like that. There was one where we had to go into this sort of plant filled conservatory type area. And we had, to, there were some books on the floor and we had to describe things in a foreign language. Yes. Either our own foreign language or from one of the books on the floor i think there was a swedish dictionary and yeah there was um, a maybe a swahili dictionary as well i seem to remember that's right yeah. yeah and so i um i did it in german because that because i i speak a bit of german and there were quite a lot of things that i just happened to know the name of that's great and i thought oh, i've definitely i've definitely won this one but actually when well, now i think about it i don't think i did probably because there was a lot of bright people in that. I expect Dave did it in Latin. Yeah, everything. probably. Um, so these best upside down films, I mean, personally, um, I think my favourite was Johnny's, um, which was the uh, the charity. Oh, uh, that's the right. Charity yes. appeal for, for sufferers of upside, upside downism, I believe, was the uh, was the cause that he was raising money for. It was a perfect little sketch, but I think the the moment where they're in the trampoline park, so he is the upside down man is stuck on the ceiling. And then he had everyone jumping up and down in the trampoline park. I thought it was touching. I thought it was funny. I, I, I absolutely loved it. And he did. He yeah. did bring the points home. He, he won in the end. He did. And also he was the only one that kind of went for a charity. Yeah. Um, you know, I must admit, I like Richard's actually, because it to me, it looked like some sort of rather odd kind of Wild West sort of magic show. Yeah. You know, that because he was dressed up in a sort of slightly odd um costume and i just sort of like the look of it really um yeah because he was lying i think he was lying on the ceiling wasn't he from from uh the beginning just like well not just like lionel richie because he was dancing yeah. on it but uh yeah so i just like the look of his but i mean i thought they were all good really those yeah i think i think they all had something to recommend them and um, daisy's obviously had the fatal flaw of n not being upside down at all uh but yeah. i think i think richard was undermarked in this. Yeah, me too. Me too. I, I thought Greg went after him too hard about his acting, which I thought was fine. Yeah. Uh, just compared to Catherine's, not good. But I thought it, to get one point for that, I think, was a shame. And I'd imagine they had to edit out a lot of arguments after that. So what are we supposed to take from it? You're, I'm not going to explain. You don't go to... You don't go to the director and go, what was that meant to be? You don't go to Stanley Kubrick and go, what well, was that you, meant you, to be? You do if Stanley Kubrick wants some points. <laughs> And in relation to this upside down video task, there is a return to our regular feature, which is BFF with Alex Horn. Ooh, hello, it's little Alex Horn here, your new BFF bonus fact finder. And the bonus fact I've found for you today regards Richard Herring's Upside Down film. 
It does, of course, have echoes of Lionel Richie's walking or dancing on the ceiling song. And the video for that song, wow, listen to this bonus fact. It cost a staggering $400,000 and was one of the most memorable and expensive clips of the 80s. It used a rotating room effect, uh, which Fred Astaire also did in the 1951 movie Royal Wedding. Richard Herring's movie cost £12 and it used the famous rotating camera technique where we... Actually, we didn't even do that. We just flipped it in post. But it did require some excellent acting from Richard Herring and some wires erected by the director, Mr Andy Devonshire. It took us a total of 45 minutes, so it was within the time limit. And I think it was as good as Lionel Richie's effort. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Bye-bye. We come to the second task uh, proper of the episode. Uh, it's a classic Taskmaster uh, food business task. Um, who can get the most spaghetti in a grapefruit? And the twist being that they turn the lights off after two minutes and you have to do it in the dark. Yeah. Um, now, this, this, felt like, this felt like something that I think you would have been quite good at, Joe. I think you would have nailed this. Well, do you know what? I, I'm sure, obviously, we all do this, don't we? And I'm sure you did as well for, oh, how would I have done that? Yeah. And I think what I would have done is I would have I would have um, just got uh, the the grapefruit, cut it in half, scooped it out, and then, then flattened it as much as I could so you could sort of wrap it round the spaghetti like almost oh, like nice. a ribbon, you know. Yeah. Um, but I did, I thought Daisy had the right idea because it was it went on weight, didn't it? And she cooked it. And obviously, cooked oh. spaghetti is much heavier, isn't it? Than um... yes, but I want. I I think they didn't weigh the spaghetti afterwards. They weigh. Oh, I see. How they just weighed left. what was left. That's right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. I think almost it was clever to go and cook it. Like that would have been an instinct I had as well. Go and cook the spaghetti. That must be a good way around it. But I challenge whether it looked impressive. But was all her spaghetti in the grapefruit? A lot of it was spilling out of the sides. I'd I'd say it doesn't feel like it was well, in it. I don't know. Am I, I being too? Would you have argued that one? I, yeah, you I, know I, I would, Joe. I, yeah, of course you would. <laughs> um, even if it wasn't all in the grapefruit, you even if it was me, you did yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I, I know what you mean because it was spilling out a bit, but surely some bit of each bit of spaghetti was in the grapefruit. I thought. Uh, so. Okay, so you would have argued it on strands. If the if the part of the strand was in the grapefruit, yeah, then it's technically in. Yeah, all right. I'll I'll let you both have that one. A lot of people went quite route one with it, but I think some of those ones you just have to start, don't you? When there's two minutes, you just have to do the first thing that comes to well, you. Well, also that room is kind of, I find that unsettling, that room with the yeah. sort of, you know, it's like an abattoir uh, because, yeah. because that's what abattoirs are like. They have kind of plastic sheeting everywhere. <laughs> You know, if there's an awful kind of horrible yeah. mess, it's kind of easy to clear up. So I always used to feel slightly chilled when I went in there, like I was <laughs> like I was in some weird kind of horror film. And not only was I going to be doing the, and especially if the lights went off, I would yes. have just assumed someone was going to try and murder me. So um, yeah, I was glad I didn't do that one. Also, that task. Uh, because it was in that room, brought to mind the cup of tea making one we had to do. Do you remember that? That was, uh, that, I think that was probably my lowest moment on television <laughs> when. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. In a, it, it, you it was did my win, fault. Though. It, was my, it was my fault um, that I, I decided to spit the milk into Alex's tea. Oh, yes. Um, and That's I, right. It was being encouraged by everyone in the room. Uh, quite often when I was doing something and it looked like I was going to do something disgusting, you'd look at the crew and they'd all be nodding and gleefully grinning. Uh, and uh, and then I'd be encouraged <laughs> to do it. So, yeah, I spat the milk in and that was that was the only moment when I was watching it back and going, oh, no, my, my mum's really not going to be happy about this. <laughs> But that yes. that was in, in that one you and I mean you and David who I think are my favourite team in Taskmaster history. Uh, I believe in that one you went to the toilet halfway through the timed task, didn't you, Joe? Yes. <laughs> Is that all right? Well, it was either that or being continent on on television, which I haven't actually done yet ever. Thank God, <laughs> it'll happen soon because I'm getting older. Obviously, I'll give it a couple of years. 
And I'll wet myself on extra slice or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't I think, know. I think extra slice is the, is the place to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll do my best. While talking about how moist a slice of cake is, that's absolutely <laughs> exactly. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Moan, in that bit of controversy, it's our first Taskmaster controversy. Moan is branded the sneaky pasta snake uh, for taking taking pasta from the room and dumping it in his dressing room bin to try and uh, to try and fiddle fiddle the results. Yes, but I I kind of at first that sort of made my head explode a bit that he'd done that because um, I thought, well, what can he possibly gain from that? You know, because they'd yeah. already obviously weighed it. Yeah, I guess I guess it's if they're weighing, but I don't think he knew this. I don't think he knew that they were going to weigh what was left and then take that away from what was originally there, and that's how much they assumed was in the grapefruit. Because if he knew that, it's very clever to get rid of pasta because then they'd assume it was just all in the. Well, yes, absolutely. But so, what what was his motivation in getting rid of it then? So it looked like he'd used it all up. I think that was suggested. That's what he did, but I don't. Yeah. I don't think. I, you know, I've we've seen Moan over three episodes now. I don't think he did that deliberately. He tried to put helium in an egg in the first episode. I think he panicked <laughs> and just grabbed the pasta on the way out and then put it in his dressing room bin. Just to be tidy. Just to, just to be tidy. I mean, you do mad <laughs> things when you're doing Taskmaster. You know, the, well, the, did... yeah, and that's what is such a great element of it, really, isn't it? Yeah, um, it, pan you... it panics people. And like you say, especially especially that room. I think there's something about that room. It feels like an episode of Dexter. You've got Alex. Alex is not unlike a serial killer. I can imagine him being a serial no, killer. No, abs I totally agree with you there. Absolutely. <laughs> the benignest of serial killers, but even so, a serial killer. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Uh, right, so obviously that was a that was a daisy victory uh, in that uh, in that task with seven hundred and fifty seven grams of pasta. Uh, Mawan was second, despite being a sneaky pasta snake. Exactly, uh, he, he still did very well. Yeah, Catherine came in uh, bottom with uh, with seventy three grams. She got the one point. Uh, Richard with two points. Not a great episode for Richard so far. I could see how Catherine and Richard happened, really, because all they did was, like, stick individual um, stalks in, really, wasn't it? As if yeah. as if they were in a kind of um, junior school art and crafts <laughs> Halloween thing, and they were taking it home to their mum. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, that's why I kind of admire Daisy, because immediately she thinks of what's the biggest thing I can do here. Yeah. Whereas Catherine, I think, is quite dainty. And in a, in a way, she, she gives a nod to sort of the aesthetics of it. Do you know what I mean? She yes, just, like, I see what you mean. Tear it in half, tear the grapefruit <laughs> apart and just shove it in. Which I think, um, you know, at Daisy and certainly uh, Johnny does that kind of thing too. They're kind of pragmatic vandals, the pair of them. Well, speaking of uh, pragmatic vandals, especially in the case of Johnny, let's move on to uh, the final pre-recorded task of the show, uh, which was catapult the shoe into the bath, uh, and it was a timed task. First of all, let's talk. Let's talk about what you might have done, Joe, because I feel like this task might not have been up your street. Uh, no, I don't think it would either. I mean, I think it's kind of purely luck those circumstances, because no one knows how f how hard you have to hit something with your foot to make a shoe go a certain distance. So once you start doing it and you get a picture of it, if you're a consistent performer, which I certainly am not, <laughs> then you can sort of work towards getting it in there. But with me, my performance with those sort of things is so all over the place. Theoretically, I could probably easily have gone on for two hours trying to get that in and just given up in the end. So that certainly wasn't my kind of task, no. The, th the other thing that, that Catherine did, which I thought was so sweet and so hilarious, and I would have done that as well, is just somehow forgetting how you actually use a catapult, a handheld one, and yeah. just kind of like doing it the wrong way. It's why, it's like when you try and do archery and you sort of forget how to draw back a bow so that an yeah. arrow actually goes, and it always just goes Bleh, like that Bleh. on the floor, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I possibly would have tried that a few times, but I think like the, the, the pivot method was definitely the one to go for. I think that was definitely the way to go. I mean, yeah, as uh, as shown by Catherine, um, who 
asks for Alex's help a lot and he normally says yes, which is very interesting. I don't think Alex ever offered to help me, but he seems to sort of have taken pity on Catherine, especially in this task. He was at one point pulling the shoe back between her legs to let go. (laughs) And she was so confident every time that she'd, she'd nailed it. So the shoe would obviously just fall behind her and then she'd immediately get up and go, where's it gone? And look towards the bath. As if, as if it, it was it, hiding yeah. in the bath. <laughs> I know, bless her. I thought it was lovely. <laughs> Every time as well. It wasn't just once and then she realised it was a bad method. She was like, well, it's probably gone in the bath this time, hasn't it? I know, it's so strange, isn't it? You didn't, for some reason, you didn't get the, the impression she was building on her current no. knowledge, you know. <laughs> The same mistakes just kept happening, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Now, we've got to talk about Johnny here because I think this was my highlight of the episode. I'm a simple man who likes simple comedy and Johnny Vegas uh, standing on a ladder and then saying, have you been injured in an accident that wasn't your fault? And then the ladder breaking under him was (laughs) perfect. (laughs) It was. was. There's also nothing (laughs) better than watching an old fat person fall off something. And I know that to my cost, because every time I've done it, people have thought it was absolutely hilarious. He's oh, such a great. brilliant kind of physical character. But yeah, him just really falling is. off a ladder, was that was my highlight as well. <laughs> oh, it was so funny. And he does, I mean, obviously, he, he knows how to play with pathos and tragedy so much within his persona. Uh, that just The fact it was Johnny Vegas breaking a ladder and falling off it while saying something quite ridiculous <laughs> and perfect beforehand was ideal. I felt I felt like he should have got an extra point for that. Oh, me too, definitely. Uh, the catapult task, of course, was won by Daisy, again, who's uh, who won the pasta task and the catapult task. A very good episode for Daisy. Yeah, I mean, incredible because of like, Daisy's general, um, well, pregnancy day and also you, you know you had kind of some big strong guys there that might have uh, managed it better but yeah really really impressed now i'm we don't normally talk about the studio task uh, too much but uh, i thought it was a good studio task Um, The drawing task, they had to uh, draw, uh, it's like Pictionary, uh, team Pictionary, but with a rotating uh, rotating podium. And very quickly, they realised that they could disrupt the other person's drawing as it came round to them. So the whole thing was absolute chaos. Yes, it was. And yeah, there was plenty of, uh, there are plenty of options for sabotage. But also there, I mean... I think the thing was, unless you got your points out of the way fairly early on, as it speeded up, it didn't really matter which one was yours and which one was the other person, because they all looked absolutely appealing. Um, So, you know, if you got it really quickly, got in sort of two or three questions right, then the the rest of it was pretty pointless, really. Yeah, Apart from scribbling on the other person's going, you know. It did, yeah, it immediately turned into the most childish task in Taskmaster history, just people scribbling on sheets of paper. <laughs> now, we got loads of questions, actually, about um, about your one of your finest moments, I think, in Taskmaster, uh, which was a studio task. It showed quite how uh, relaxed you were during the studio tasks. It was the game of uh, Horse or Laminator, um, which, to remind people, was uh, where Greg had a picture of a horse or a laminator in front of him. And we had to guess uh, whether it was a horse or a laminator. And I don't know how many you got in a row, Joe, but it was it was over 20 and it was spooky. I think it was th- about 13 or 14, actually. Wow. But, it, but, it but I think to put it in context, <coughs> I, I think I got two. <laughs> As most people on average sort of got two to three, I think. And then it, it, you, we were there for so long. I think they were panicking about the edit because it was like an hour and a half of you just <laughs> getting well, all sorts of I know, it was, it was really weird. And I was slightly spooked by it myself. Um, yeah. And I think we worked out what the chances of, of doing that many in a row were. And it was about eight and a half thousand to one. Incredible. Is, I know. Have you shown psychic abilities be- beforehand? Um... Well, I wouldn't, I, no, I don't think so, really. I mean, I've kind of seen ghosts and that sort of thing, but that might just have been because I was pissed, I don't know. <laughs> um, 
But I did think after it that I did have some weird sort of ability. I, I, I looked at a couple of things on Twitter. One thing I really loved was that someone suggested I could see in David's glasses the reflection of the... Um, yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever image it was. Uh, hilarious, uh, wrong. But actually, um, since then, uh, to be honest, I've rather vainly kind of thought about should I try and exploit this um somehow or just find out a bit more about whether i have got uh, any power I so i went straight home and did the irish lottery <laughs> <laughs> nothing um <laughs> you know not, not even one number the same well that's that's a problem i think the main problem with the irish lottery is it's not based on a horse or laminator system but that is the problem i know yeah. maybe i should have a word with them uh, but I do occasionally, like, one thing I find uh, really weird is kind of like inadvertent messages. And I don't know if you do this, but I, I very rarely, um, with with my phone, um, you, you know, I just put it in my pocket before I've locked it. And so, a lot, you know how, like, you get weird messages, like, yeah. coming up? Um, um, and you just look at them and go, what does that mean? Well, for example, one the other day I did, this, this message came up. Uh, that had obviously I'd pocket written it, and it said "Wazoo Hurty Hurty." <laughs> <laughs> what? So I looked up Wazoo, and that is um, a town in Estonia. And so, yeah, I know. How weird is that? That it was actually a word. So I'm, I'm thinking that if something happens there. Yeah. Where people get hurt in the next couple of weeks, that is really going to seal my, you know, <laughs> reputation. Yeah. Yeah, you can only if if it turns out you are psychic, but you can only predict disasters in Estonia. I don't know how you're going to make use <laughs> well, of that, I, really. No, exactly. But I can always incorporate it into extra slides. I must say to them, let's have an Estonian week on Bake Off, and then I can do my Wazoo story. <laughs> wazoo so, hurty you know. hurty. <laughs> um, so I do occasionally, well, no, more than occasionally, have lots of really weird coincidences in my life. But I think probably most people do, and I'm over egging it really. Laminator. I mean, I am starting to think she is reading my mind. <laughs> so it was a, another studio task victory for uh, Daisy and Richard, who are both very good at the studio tasks. Richard especially, I think, uh, he just sort of gets his head down and gets on with it. He's very industrious in the studio tasks. He really wants to win, I think. Yes, I think so too. I mean... I can't. It, I can't remember whether Richard's an Oxbridge person or not because I think is, that, I think, that yeah. adds an extra sort of steel to your innards, which makes you mm. more competitive, you know, and also makes you more confident in a way. Uh, whereas, like someone like Daisy, who I don't think went to Oxbridge, has kind of got that somewhere else, that supreme confidence, and it's nice to see those two different. Um, you know, approaches come up against each other, I Go think. Go head, head, yeah, it's great. So Daisy won the episode, uh, and quite rightly, I think, after the, the grapefruit victory. I think that was a, a deserved uh, victory, which I believe puts her on top so far. She is in the lead, but it's all it's all pretty tight in the series. I think in our series, maybe by this point, it was clear who the bottom place was going to be. I'll say that. Yeah, well, and also it, well, I was vying for that until my horse and laminator sort of <laughs> dragged me screaming from way down the bottom to not that far off the top, which is so weird. Yeah. But uh, yeah, poor old Dave was. Uh, mm. Yeah, I think the first episode took him by surprise when he could see what everyone else had done compared to what he'd done. But then he got used to it very quickly, I think. Yeah, and he was just delighted, like I was, to actually be able to make a cup of tea during a task <laughs> and have a chat. <laughs> We've had loads of emails in, Joe. I'm going to uh, let's ask you some questions from the Taskmaster public. Um, this is a good one. Uh, we sort of uh, we touched on this topic earlier. Uh, Dear Joe and Ed, what was the task with the greatest disparity between how well you thought it went at the time compared to how it actually turned out watching it in the studio? Oh, that is such a great question. That's from Sophie. Well, I, I said one that really upset me was that one with um, with wheelie bins with th who was hiding in a wheelie bin. We had to find Alex who was hiding in a wheelie bin, right? We, we did. We could only do a, a certain amount of things. And by that point, I, I think we hadn't done that much. And I was extremely naive because I didn't think 
that they'd put other things in the other wheelie bins. Why didn't <laughs> I think that? I just thought it would be like so easy. And that if you if you picked one up that was heavy, that was because he was in it. I'm honestly yeah. I was so stupid. Um and so I looked really stupid in that. And it it kind of I thought, oh, I've done all right in that. Everyone else will think the same as me. And of yeah. course, nobody did. So I felt <laughs> bad about that. I believe you opened the last bin to check to see if Alex was in it. Uh, and you opened it and looked in and said, oh, it's Elaine Page. And then just slammed the bin and left again. <laughs> <laughs> that, wouldn't that have been great, though? What, that would have been what a surprise. Then? Um, I think mine might have been, I tell you what, I really thought I'd nailed on the day because of the crew's reaction was uh, make one of your body parts longer than it actually is. Oh, yeah. And I chose the leg uh, and I went and got my spare pair of trousers and sort of stuffed them right down in my actual trousers and filled it with newspaper. So I had a, an extra leg and put a shoe on the end of it and sat on top of a wheelie bin. Uh, and then they, you know, they filmed it with Alex standing next to me. And at the time I thought, this looks amazing. It looks perfect. It looks exactly like I've got a really long leg. But of course, the problem is I couldn't actually see how it looked. I could only see it from above because it was attached to me. And then when you saw it back, it didn't look like my leg at all. It looked like I'd stuffed some newspaper in a spare <laughs> pair of jeans. And then just to compound the problem, Rose's was absolutely amazing. She was oh, at the Rose's top of the caravan. Oh, Rose's was brilliant. Yeah, it absolutely was so good. brilliant. It was yeah. so good. And then I was like, oh, no, that's that's how I should have done it. So that was the one where it was sort of that stomach dropping feeling of even when they come back to it in the studio, you can hear the audience are a bit like, oh, OK, they're not on board with it. This is from Laura. Uh, I often wonder what outfit I would wear if I were on Taskmaster. So my questions are, what do you think are some of the most memorable competitor outfits throughout the series? Uh, and are contestants given any sort of guidance as to what they may or may not want to wear? Um, I don't think people are given any um, guidance uh, as to uh, what to wear. I think what I wore was the most unmemorable thing ever because basically you get to this stage in your life, yawn, yawn, it's an old woman talking again. <laughs> but actually you just don't want to be uncomfortable. Yeah. So you just want to wear kind of utilitarian kind of, you know, leggings and a kind of crappy old T-shirt. Um I mean, I think actually Lisa Tarbuck did that as well. She just looked very comfortable to me in a kind of... But um, yeah, I think I think that's important. I think that's a really important point that you can wear the craziest thing possible, but it, it does... You are doing like some physical stuff. You are in it all day, so it does need to be vaguely comfortable. That's why, yeah, I went for the all denim, but denim's pretty comfy. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just trying... I think... So, so far, Daisy looks amazing because... Yeah, it's a pretty incredible uh, outfit. I, well, I really admire her. Just, I mean, I admire her generally a lot, but, you know, from that point of view, and, and doing quite physical tasks as yeah. well, and in that outfit. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, the, yeah, her outfit is great. I think Moan's outfit is really good. There's, there's a big history of the people wearing boiler suits or jumpsuits in yeah. Taskmaster, um, which is, I don't know if they... They would sort of steer people away from that now. I think Moans is really cool, but he dresses amazingly anyway. Even in the studio, I think he's got a he's got a very he's got an amazing look. yes. And I was his nails match his outfit, which yes. I'm very impressed by. I've never managed that in my life. So <laughs> good on him. I always thought Noel Fielding's was very good. He had a skeleton painted onto a, a oh, yellow yes, boiler suit, indeed. which was great. Um, no, Noel think, Fielding but, is like a work of art walking around, though, isn't he? You know, yeah. you would expect a lot from him, really. Yeah, exactly. That's Yeah, Noel's probably up there as a favourite. Mel Gedroich's jumpsuit was very cool as oh, well, yes, I think. Oh, yes, indeed. Lou Sanders also had a jumpsuit, but she had uh, Taskmaster Series 8 Champion written on the back of it, uh, which was a very funny arrogant thing to do and the fact that she then went on to win made it even more arrogant i think yes indeed <laughs> <laughs> um this is from chris in newcastle uh how well do you think greg would do as a contestant on taskmaster well what i love about greg is i like to think of him being a teacher because he to me he is the ultimate he has the ultimate control weapon as a t as a teacher he must have done which is a massive sarcasm you know yeah and and if there's anything that makes kids sort of 
sort of shut up. It's being humiliated by a really sarcastic, funny teacher. And so I think that he'd be like that in it. And he'd be... He he would just he would just cut a sway through the other contestants and knock them down to size and find some way of making them so disturbed and humiliated that they wouldn't be able to finish the tasks. <laughs> I think I think you're probably right. I think it also depends on what sort of task he was doing on any given episode. Uh, because I think with the creative stuff, he'd be brilliant. Like making yeah. an upside down film, I think he'd be incredible at that sort of thing. Uh, anything sort of thinky, I think he'd be good at. I think he's, you know, he's a really clever bloke. Anything too physical, I think would be a disaster. Uh, and he'd get quite frustrated. Uh, I played rounders with him quite recently uh, and he missed the ball every time and looked very angry with himself. Well, I, I can empathise with that, but I agree with you. I can't actually see him ever breaking into a jog, let alone a run, to get anywhere. But again, I'm kind of with that concept, so that would be fair enough. Yeah, you never. I, what, you knew that you didn't want to do that, so you never tried, which, no. which I thought was great. You were just like, I'm, abs- I'm not doing it, it's not going to be good, I'm just going to do it in my own way and bring the task to me. Well, and also I really honestly don't think it actually makes that much difference. Yeah. Really, if you run somewhere, because it's not exactly a big garden, is it? <laughs> it's only going to be a second's difference if you get if you run down it. Anyway, that's what I thought. Sometimes <laughs> a second is very important in Taskmaster Joe. Well, all right, yeah, and that's why you <laughs> won. <laughs> Uh, before we say goodbye to you, Joe, do you have any predictions for who might win this series of Taskmaster? Well, I think kind of what it's going to come down to in the end is is people kind of relaxing about it, you know, because I think, I mean, I, I, I see Daisy winning at the moment, but I think that's because Daisy's got a sort of relaxed charm about her that enables her to kind of calmly go about the best way to do something. But then, you know, if, if, if Richard is really quite competitive, who knows whether that's going to win out um, in the end. But I would say I'd like um, Catherine to win <laughs> <laughs> because I'd like her to come in and do something amazing in the yeah. last couple and, and people just go, oh, my Lord, look, she's brilliant. And, um, you know, I think people have thought, oh, she, you know, she's not going to she's not going to win. And I'd really love it if she did. Yeah. She'd take herself by surprise, I think, as well. Yeah, she really she's not would. Yeah. To win. yeah. Um, and finally, before you go, Joe, would you just rate your experience on the Taskmaster podcast between one and five points? Oh, Good Lord. Well, I would say uh, a five for enjoyment from me. Good. And a one for achievement. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take the five. We're taking the okay. five points. That's what we're taking. Joe Brown, thank you so much for coming on the Taskmaster podcast. Thank you. Pleasure. Loved it all. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. So there we have it. That is the third episode of the Taskmaster podcast done. And dusted uh the series is looking very exciting now points wise already daisy is of course in the lead with 48 points after an absolutely stunning episode from her uh richard very close behind on 46 points but then everyone else is pretty close together johnny's on 42 uh mwan's on 38 catherine lagging behind slightly on 32 uh but that's still not a lot of points in between last and first place it makes for a very exciting and interesting series uh can't wait to see the next episode and we will of course be back next week to chat all about that uh, if you want to get any questions in uh for me or my special guest next week the taskmaster the email is taskmasterpodcast at gmail.com. So if you email questions to taskmasterpodcast at gmail.com, we will have a look at that question and we will ask my special guest next week. Uh, for all things Taskmaster, go on to youtube.com forward slash Taskmaster. Uh, if you want to buy some lovely Taskmaster trinkets for Christmas or birthdays or just for fun, uh, go to Taskmaster Store. Com. Now, I've made reference to my special guest next week. I can now confirm that the special guest next week is Paul Chowdhury. 
That's right, Bastard's crying in it. Paul Chowdhury will be here in the Taskmaster podcast studio, which is not a real studio. We do it on Zoom. Uh, we will be chatting to him about next week's episode and also his time on Taskmaster, an intriguing and very funny man. Don't forget to watch next week's episode, 9pm, Channel 4, or for the family-friendly version, Sunday at 6 o'clock on E. Four. But for now, get your questions in for Paul Chowdhury. Thank you very much to Drow Brand. We will see you next week. Goodbye. La, 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 la. La, la, la. For more Taskmaster, subscribe now. 